Okay, good morning, everybody. It's our pleasure to welcome you to the sixth conference of the European Association for Critical Animal Studies. Sorry for the delay. The first registration, the first day is a little bit complicated. We, we hope that the rest of the, the sessions and everything will be on time. We are very happy to have you all here, excited with uh, more than 220 people registered, more than 100 papers to be presented, only a few drops the last minute. So really excited to have so many people working and fighting for animal liberation. And uh, well, just that was all only to say welcome and thank you. I am speaking on behalf of the organizing committee. We are Efe Paez, Maria Carreras, Laura Fernandez, Katia Faria, and also Daniela Walhorn and Sandra Amigo, who are coming later, and myself, Nuri Almiron. We are members of the Center for Animal Ethics here at the UPF. And well, we have been working these last uh, months for preparing this for you with uh, the inspiration that the last conference at Lund gave to all of us. And just a few words to the people who has made this possible, because only us, we couldn't have made it. We are very thankful to the Department of Communication, all the administrative staff there, to all the administrative people at, at the UPF uh, Poplano campus, including the technics here in the auditorium, to, of course, uh, the, the ESLA group, the Students' Association for Animal Liberation, who are uh, helping us those three days here, 10 wonderful students with a shirt that you probably have seen at the entrance with a hand of our, from our poster. Uh, we also are very thank you to the former organizers at Lund because they gave us a lot of good advice and also even financial sponsorship. And then, of course, to our sponsors. We have been funded by the Department of Communication, by the Critic Research Group at the Communication Department, by the Department of Law here at the UPF, uh, by Ariwa, by Lash, and also a huge thank you to Rita Gwing, who has been our best and, and largest sponsor, and as always, she has been in the last, in the last uh, editions of this conference. And also thank you to our providers, because all our providers are wonderful, big, and committed people, including Astacio Bagana, La Raposa, Baganiseria, and photographer advocate Tras Los Muros, who uh, was very kind to share with us and allow us to use the hand in the poster for the conference. So that's a, just uh, a few, a few uh, comments to help you orientate here. We have four rooms for this conference. Uh, this auditorium and three rooms more that are just behind this wall, just behind. You can access the three walls going either left or right when exiting. These are the four rooms for the main panels. All the keynotes and the two activist roundtables will take place here. And then we have also three rooms for the workshops this afternoon that are not here, will be signaled, and the volunteers also will help you attend if you want to attend the workshops. And then in the auditorium hall, we have, uh, we'll have all the coffee breaks. We uh, need to ask you, please, to wait for the time for the coffee break to open to, to start drinking. Also, we want to share with you that all the, the, the dishes and the glasses are biodegradable. So uh, if you can make a very wise use, we will appreciate. And uh, then we will, have, we will offer lunches in what we call the tunnel which is a tunnel very close to the rooms behind this wall where we have the other, the other sessions. And I think that's, that's everything. Uh, we, we are really excited and happy, and we wish you can have the best experience possible and uh, forgive all the mistakes we may have made in the program, everything. We have been so flexible that we have accepted so late registrations and late everything that in the end, of course, that makes a lot of mistakes uh, staying in, in the program. But just that, three days ahead, and now the first keynote with us. Thank you. Hello. OK. So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to the opening keynote uh, of the conference. Uh, my name is Katia Faria. I'm chairing the session. And I'm very pleased to start with this amazing guest, uh, our friend and colleague, Elisa Altola. Uh, for the few of you unfamiliar with Altola's work, 
She's presently a Collegium Research and Philosophy at the University of Turku in Finland and has written extensively on animal ethics, animal philosophy, and also moral psychology, including her latest book, Varieties of Empathy, Moral Psychology, and Animal Ethics. Following this line of research, her talk today focuses on emotions, as political and moral concepts, the need for radically new animal emotions. So we'll have uh, approximately 45 to uh, an hour of presentation, then we have space for Q&A. So thank you very much for joining us, uh, Elisa, and go ahead. Uh, thank you, Katya. <clears throat> and thank you for all the organizers for inviting me and making this event possible. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant to see so many people here, um, and I'm thrilled to be um, starting this conference. Um, my fo the, well, the focus of my recent research has been on moral psychology in um, the context of uh, animal issues and animal ethics and animal philosophy in a broader sense. And this talk will be on that theme as well. Um, I'm going to make a slight diversion from the original program and speak of shame, uh, particularly species shame. But the abstract that I send is pretty much the same. Um, but the title is slightly different. And yes, so the focus will be shame. Whether well, shame is an emotion that can actually um, um, hinder or um, cultivate our understanding of animality. Now to start off with, I have to emphasize how emotions are important for um, moral agency. This is not a novel um, argument. Uh, Plato, David Hume, Baru Spinoza and various other classical philosophers have argued that emotions make us understand or construct the concepts of good and bad. Plato, for instance, in his dialogue Protagoras, argued that suffering as an emotion makes us construct the concept of moral evil or bad, whereas happiness, happiness or enjoyment makes us construct the concept of good. Spinoza, in his ethics, argued that melancholy leads to uh, bad and, and joy leads to good. And this is a very old um, claim uh, in philosophy. In contemporary terms, Iris Murdoch has argued that emotions color the world with normative hues. So we start to understand reality in a normative sense uh, with the um, help of emotions. And it is thereby our effective nature, rather than purely logical ability, which has the strongest influence on moral agency. And this is really significant and important. Often we try to think of ethics as something based on reason and rationality, but this simply is not the case, as has been um, understood in um, history of philosophy as well. Uh, today this is a common stance also in other sciences. For instance, the neuropsychologist Lisa Feldman Barrett has argued that emotions are concepts which render reality meaningful to us. Emotions here are simulations or predictions which construct our take of the world. They are not chaotic forces, but rather a method of conceptualizing <coughs> internal and external phenomena. So when we have emotions, we construct meaning and a sense of the world. We simulate uh, various events and construct what the world comprises of. And here emotions become learned categories of situated conceptualization. Sorry, I'm having some sort of a panic attack suddenly. Um, no, it's fine. But this means that emotions also help to conceptualize morality. So they help us to make sense of reality. When we have emotions or affects, we understand the world in a different manner. But this also enables us to understand what um, morality and moral values comprise of. So emotions as concepts influence also how we define or value other animals. First off, they enable us to describe animality, to define pigs or cows, and also to value other animals. They help us to construct values regarding uh, animal ethics. 
Now, this is not a... This is not a novel claim. Maybe I should sit down. I'm having some sort of a weird disease. But yeah. Yes, I'm sorry about this. I'm having a weird, weird. Um, I've had some. Yeah, some issues in my in my recent uh, uh, personal life. So suddenly I'm feeling slightly fragile. But let's let's hope this gets better. Maybe I should start with the previous slide. So in neuropsychology, I have to explain this better. Emotions are concepts which. Uh, make the world manifest to us. So, so they actually build or construct reality for us. We simulate the world based on what sort of emotions we have. So the, the reality is not made sense of purely on rational grounds. We don't only, only make sense of it through reason or observation, but also emotions are here extremely relevant. And what happens is that we simulate the future based on our past experience. So the sorts of emotions or experiences we have had in the past go on to predict what will happen in, in the future scenarios. And this means that they are not chaotic forces in the sense that they would be metaphorically blind, uh, something that just happens, something that's innate and um, non-rational. But they also have this sort of a predictive component. And this is really emphasized these days in cognitive sciences and neuropsychology. And there's a lot of empirical uh, research to back this claim up. And it's because of this that emotions as concepts also help to define uh, non-human beings and the sorts of values that we attach to other animals. So in co combining the natural sciences outlook and the philosophical outlook, we can see how affects and emotions construct, simulate, predict, conceptualize uh, what other animals are ontologically and what they are normatively. And this leads to the pretty uh, common claim these days that rationalistic animal ethics only offers a very limited take on non-human relations. And this becomes really evident when we consider uh, the meat paradox or what I have termed uh, omnivores acrasia. In the context of the meat paradox, people claim to love animals or really uh, endow them with inherent value, see significance in them, uh, accentuate and underline how they morally evaluate animals. Uh, and in omnivores acrasia, they similarly claim uh, that we should not cause other animals suffering, we should see inherent value in them, we ought to treat them completely differently. But still, in the crypts of the meat paradox, omnivores acrasia, uh, people who claim to love the animals eat the very same beings. And this is a very common phenomenon. So in order to make sense of this, we really have to note that rationalist claims and arguments are not enough. I'm sure many of you have come uh, across people who accept animal ethical arguments and theories, who have heard of Peter Singer, for instance, who offers a very clear, succinct, rational theory of why we ought to treat other animals differently. But they remain unconvinced. And on the basis of empirical sciences and the sorts of philosophical arguments that I was presenting really quickly, it seems that emotions and affects really uh, have a part to play in this. It's because people have, firstly, different cultural intuitions and stereotypes attached to pigs or cows, and secondly, because of the sorts of emotions that it, they attach to these animals, that they continue to uh, make use of animals in ways that are unethical. And this leads to the need of effective animal ethics. Exploring the normative role of emotions. We can't only uh, construct understandings of uh, animal ethics or animal philosophy or even animal studies based solely on reason and analysis. We also need to uh, notice the influence of emotions. 
Now, usually the focus is only on positive emotions. So, for instance, when various feminist scholars who came up with this idea of uh, the need to include emotions in animal ethics, um, emphasis was on love or <coughs> empathy. And I have taken part in this too. I have written extensively on empathy in animal ethics and also on love. But what about the negative emotions? The people who are struggling with the meat eaters paradox and the meat paradox, the omnivore secretia, they are not doing that because of their love or empathy. They're doing that because of something else. So there is a clear need for wider research. We need to understand, explore also the negative affects and emotions attached to pigs or hens or cows. And here's a reason. Look at that picture. What sorts of emotions come to your mind? Is it love or empathy? Of course, you could claim that the woman in the picture ought to have more empathy towards other animals. But what, what about the others who see her? What sort of, sorts of uh, affects should they uh, approach that image with? It becomes pretty obvious that unless we also pay attention, pay focus on anger, even rage, fury, or shame, these sorts of uh, animal ethical issues, which ought to be obvious to the woman, will not surface. So the question then is, which emotion concepts advance our moral agency in relation to pigs or dogs or pikes or salmons? And one possibility that I'm interested in is the Wittgensteinian route, where language and uh, concepts are a method of creating the reality. This is uh, famous from Wittgenstein's early work in Tractatus. He maintained that language creates reality. Language sets the limits of our world. Words are a way of constructing this sphere in which we live. And if we accept the idea that emotions also are concepts, that they are not metaphorically chaotic or blind forces, but that they are ways of rendering reality meaningful, this means that they are also uh, factors which might construct the animal world for us the world of human-animal relations for us. And this again, if we follow the Wittgensteinian route, might imply that there's a need to form new emotion concepts or categories to better understand the non-human we are. So if the existing emotions that we have conceptualize animality, and if they fail to do that in a way that would make us understand and grasp other animals and their value better, then perhaps we need to have new emotion concepts. Perhaps we need to cultivate new sorts of emotions. So my question is, are standard emotion concepts too limited to make moral sense of what it is to be a bat or a pig or a pike? Does the woman with the giraffe struggle because she doesn't have adequate emotion concepts or an adequate emotional vocabulary to make uh, make sense of animality. And one relatively rare emotion concept which I will be speaking of is species shame. Now shame is usually seen as a destructive uh, emotion. I will be here referring to both psychological and philosophical literature. In psychological literature, shame is often defined in a negative, morally um, destructive um, sense. It's seen as an emotion that hinders our moral ability. When in a grip of shame, we simply cannot do uh, or make wise moral uh, predictions. As an emotion, it really collapses moral agency. And in order to see why this should be the case, we can juxtapose shame with guilt, which is often done in psychologi uh, psychological research. Whereas guilt is another directed emotion, it's focused on the other being, and it's also centered on one act, so we feel guilt for one specific act, for instance, for meat eating. And whereas it's reliant on morality in the sense that only moral values can provoke guilt, we don't feel guilty for having too large a nose or not being uh, intelligent enough in the eyes of others, for instance. 
So whereas it's reliant on morality, other directness, uh, centralizing one act, it's also aimed at making reparations. So when we have guilt, we want to make things better. We want to help the other creature uh, whom, whom the act that we committed wronged in some way. So whilst guilt is, is this other directed, moral, reparatory emotion, shame is seen as its uh, uh, opposite. Shame is, emerges an, as an egoistic, self-directed emotion, first of all. It's not uh, concentrated on the other creature. It doesn't focus on what happened to the other. It focuses on what happens to the self. If we do something silly, what happens to us? We don't care about the other creature. It's also focused on the global self instead of a one act. It doesn't care about the specific act, again, say meat eating. It's focused on what the global self, the whole of self, uh, undergoes when that act has been committed. It's also reliant on amoral cues, so one can feel shame for, for having a certain sort of a nose or for having a certain sort of an intellect. And it's aimed at protecting the self. It doesn't make reparations, it doesn't seek to help the other, it's aimed at protecting the self. And because of these uh, opposing tendencies uh, within these two emotions, many psychologists such as Helen Lewis, who is very famous as a shame scholar, have argued that we ought to enhance guilt when it comes to moral agency, but we should avoid shame. So guilt is something that is actually very beneficial, it cultivates moral ability, but shame ought to be avoided. She ought not to feel shame, she ought to feel guilt, and we ought not to provoke her to feel shame. We ought not tell her she's a bad person. We ought to say to her, what you did here was wrong, but uh, otherwise you're fine as a, as a creature. Makes sense? Now, there are various empirical studies to, to offer support for this argument. Shame is often a, an excruciating emotion. It's psychologically unbearable. One reason for this is, is that it's disastrously disappointing. Um, no, 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 it's disastrous for, for us to be revealed as our true self in a dis disappointing light for others. When others view us as somehow a failure, this can be truly agonizing. For instance, the shame scholar Chun Tangi has emphasized this. There are various empirical um, studies that prove that um, shame can feel even worse than any other emotion that we have. It can be worse than grief, it can be worse than rage. Shame is unbearable to many. And this leads to the need to escape, sh escape shame at all cost, which again implies defensive behaviors. So instead of uh, aiming ourselves toward helping the other whom we have wronged, in a state of shame we become extremely defensive. Two ways that this happens, according to literature, is either withdrawal or violence. When we withdraw, we decide to abandon the human world altogether. We buy a cottage somewhere in um, Alaska and decide to cut all contact with others. So th this is the extreme version of withdrawal. We want to avoid those who have caused us shame. We want to really uh, distance ourselves from the, from the origins of shame. And this, of course, is not beneficial from the viewpoint of morality. If we withdraw, we're not facing whatever caused the shame in the, uh, in, to begin with. Violence is the o opposite form of defense. And here we can be either verbal or physical. We can start to insult others, become furious, or we can even get physically aggressive. And again, of course, this is not beneficial from the viewpoint of moral ability. 
Now, these defenses have really been underlined in shame as uh, scholarship, and, and they seem to highlight how it ought to be avoided as an emotion. Emo uh, shame really ought to be avoided. And indeed, there are various uh, relations between shame and different mental difficulties. Trauma, anxiety, depression, personality disorders have all been linked to shame, and particularly shame proneness. And this again highlights that shame is something which is not to be toyed with. We ought not to cause shame to others because it might have surprising consequences. It might be extremely uh, destructive. Now, in philosophy, Jean-Paul Sartre, in order to map out why this should be the case, Jean-Paul Sartre, in Being and Nothingness, offered the famous keyhole example. In that example, we're looking through a keyhole, uh, observing other, other people, and suddenly we realize that somebody else has snuck behind us, uh, behind us and is looking at us. And we feel ridiculous. We feel ashamed instantly. We feel utterly... Um, as a, as a failure. We are truly ridiculous in that, in, a, in that state. And this for Sartre is shame, the epitome of shame. We are caught as a visual object of another. We have been surprised, suddenly we emerge as an object. We are no longer the looking subject, but this ridiculous piece of flesh in front of another. And this very famous example has been used a lot in philosophy. For instance, Gabriel Taylor, who has written a book uh, that has uh, an emphasis on shame, but also uh, uh, pride. <coughs> she has spoken of shame as a, as a state within which we imagine an audience to be observing us. So even if we are by ourselves, we imagine this fictional fictive audience who is gazing at us, and suddenly we feel naked, completely revealed, completely ridiculous. And David Vellerman is a philosopher who has pointed out that this goes together with loss of agency, because suddenly private aspects of ourselves become public. And this is the core of shame, according to him. Again, we are the object who is looked at, in a way that makes us incapable of giving a particular sort of a social identity for others, following the sort of being that we wish to be in the eyes of others. And all these arguments point toward the fact that shame is a strongly social emotion. It concerns social identity. How others view us or perceive us is relevant here. And this means that also in-groups become relevant. So whichever in-group we belong to defines who has the power to shame us. We might not care about an out-group's opinion of us, but the in-group matters. So if the people that we associate with suddenly perceive us as an object who has become revealed, shame uh, follows. And all of this constantly underlines how shame can destroy rather than enhance moral ability. We can change one act in a state of guilt. Remember that it's focused on one act. But we cannot change our whole selves. We can't become somebody else, which is what shame seems to revolve around. And ba based on this, it can be even argued that it's immoral to cause shame. So the woman with the giraffe, if we caused her to feel shame, we'd be doing something wholly immoral. We'd bring her to an unbearable state of, of anguish that could be destructive, not only for her moral ability, but also mental health. And this very common argument in psychology is supported by contemporary Western cultures and how they tend to view shame. Shame is often, uh, or shaming is often seen as an act of violence against individual freedom. It's used as a curse word. We ought not to shame anybody. Shaming is something terrible. 
it's perceived as, 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 as an act that we really ought to avoid at all costs. And when we look at this destructive understanding of shame in the context of animal ethics, we can see that elements of it are there. For instance, withdrawal from animal-related information is very common, would you not agree? When people are offered information about the animal industries or animal suffering, they often withdraw, they don't, they don't want to hear anything more. They switch off the channel or they turn away the leaflet, they look away, they withdraw. They might start to avoid the annoying, irritating vegans. And on the, on the oppos opposing end, they might s begin with verbal attacks on social media, for instance, using the word irritating, um, pompous vegans coming here and ruin ruining everything. Verbal attacks are very common when it comes to speaking of animal issues. The antagonism is, is tangible. And even physical violence can sometimes uh, take place. I, ha I have been in situations where I have been physically attacked in the past when I was younger, when I was still an uh, animal activist. And these can be seen as, uh, or viewed as, as instances of destructive shame. Now the good news is that people thereby might feel shame. So those people who are avoiding the animal issues or who are getting angry, they might undergo shame, which suggests that they do see or do think that there's something wrong with what they're doing. But the bad news is that they are approaching it in a destructive manner, so it doesn't lead anywhere. In a previous article that I have written on shame, I, on these, cr on these grounds, claimed that guilt is beneficial when we speak of animal issues, while shame is counterproductive. And this again appears to lead to the argument that we ought to avoid criticizing omnivores, identities, or selves. We only ought to speak of given acts, like meat eating, but not speak of the identities revolved around meat eating. But there is another alternative. Uh, there is also literature that supports the idea that there is morally productive species shame, or morally productive shame that I have given the word species shame for. And my claim is that anthropocentric human identities and selves are in a serious need of reconfiguration. They are not only given acts <coughs> that lead to the violence towards non-human animals, but the identities and notions of selfhood that underlie those acts. It's not only meat-eating that is the problem, but the wider ideologies and identities and social identities in particular that uh, really kind of emphasize and uh, give uh, potency towards, to, to those acts. And when we look at the current era of the Anthropocene, climate change, the sixth species extinction, and animal industries, doesn't it become obvious that we, as human beings, who construct given identities and notions of selfhood, and given narratives of where we come from, what it means to be a human animal or a human self, we have failed. We have been revealed as failed creatures. And ought we not feel complete shame on a global level? It's not only specific acts, but the very ideologies, narratives that are used to construct what it means to be a human animal. And on the grounds of this claim, uh, I think that we need species shame. That it's a way of conceptualizing reality and animality in a refreshing manner. It might be excruciating, but it's required. The woman with the giraffe ought to feel shame, but so should most of us, or perhaps all of us, to a certain extent. Even vegans live in a very anthropocentric society, probably have various very anthropocentric elements to their identities, even without knowing it. We ought to feel humility and shame. Become the sudden objects 
gazed at through the keyhole, the Sartre's keyhole, and be revealed as something that we thought we are not. Now Derrida is famous for asking, can we feel shame in the, in the eyes of a non-human animal? When the cat was looking at him and he suddenly felt naked metaphorically and concretely, could he actually feel shame? Was he in a state of shame in front of a cat? Now regardless of how he answered this question, my answer is yes, we can feel shame in front of other animals. And this shame stems from noting the discrepancy between our ideal and real selves. Shame often concerns th this sort of uh, conflict between what we wanted to be, how we wanted to define ourselves, and what we really are like. And perhaps we ought to become naked in a Derrida way, in the metaphoric eyes of our core values. It might not be the cat who is viewing us as an object, because the cat probably perceives us in ways that we can't even fathom. But in the eyes of our very core values, in the metaphoric eyes of what we believe in, we ought to be naked, revealed, on the spot, caught as an object. And here Derrida's cat is metaphorically evaluating as peering into human selves and identities. And this could spark species shame. Here, the fact that shame involves our whole global self can be beneficial. Some uh, philosophers has, have argued that the very fact that self is not engaged only with a specific act, but the broader selfhood that we live with, is also the thing that makes it morally beneficial. Because when we focus on not... A, no, is, well, instead of a given act, when we focus on what we are like as creatures, this leads to profound change, potentially. A very broad, holistic change in how we relate to reality. And that's what's required for moral cultivation and enhancement. So in, it, in, in order to better our moral ability, we must pay attention to ourselves on a holistic, global level. maybe I'm repeating myself here slightly, but guilt in the context of non-human animals is engaged with, for instance, meat-eating, one act, where shame involves our wider values and worldviews and the selfhood that they go on to construct. And this is why the latter is required. We need to evaluate the global human self, the sorts of constructive identities that we give to ourselves as human beings. And this goes together with the need to radically reconfigure who we are and want to be. Not only what we do on a given day, what guilt might do or provoke us to think of, but what we are from day to day, from week to week, what sorts of worldviews we hold, and what we want to be like, who we want to be in the future. And on these grounds, I think species shame can be a method of moral growth. It can really help us to cultivate also animal ethical ability. Oops. What helps here is the sudden nature of shame. Many scholars of shame argue that Shame is a morally enabling emotion because it works suddenly. We might carry on with our everyday existence, uh, seek entertainment, focus on what we're going to eat in the evening, where we're going to work, who loves us. Those sorts of very routine notions keep uh, echoing in our minds constantly. And it's very hard to disrupt those mindless uh, habits of, of just everyday existence. But shame has the ability for, for disruption. It can really suddenly make us see things differently. And we can no longer focus only on what we're going to eat in the evening. 
in a state of shame, nothing else suddenly matters than what we are, who we are, what sorts of beings we are. Our self is suddenly viewed differently with flaws. And this can lead to new sorts of understandings of identity and human selfhood. And I claim that it's vital for us to notice cracks in also identities and selves built around being human. As I claimed, habituation often prevents us from becoming aware of non-human misery. So most people engage in very um, mundane activities and thoughts and emotions on an almost hourly basis or on the basis of every single second. And when we are lulled into this sort of um, state of routine and, and entertainment and also always seeking for something for ourselves in the next minute, it's very hard to notice the non-human misery and agony and suffering surrounding us. It's also very easy not to notice climate change. I think most of us, including me, really push it further away from our thoughts and emotions constantly. Is everybody here now really thinking of the fact that things are going in a terrible direction? It's unbearable to think of it every, every moment, of course. So we focus on something else. But when we focus too much on habits and keep pushing the important, crucial, really significant information further away, we're not being morally cultivating, we're not being morally productive. And because of this, we need sudden disruptions of shame. The sudden revelation, ecce homo, look at human beings. We really ought to suddenly look at ourselves differently. Suddenly. The word suddenly here is really significant. So when in a supermarket, perhaps the meat eater should be provoked suddenly to view everything differently. And when in a supermarket, perhaps the vegan ought to be provoked to suddenly remember climate change. Remember all the horrors of the current catastrophes. It's not, an old, uh, it's not a new claim to suggest that um, uh, shame can be productive. Plato, in his dialogue Symposium and Gorgias, argued that we learn the good partly by learning what is shameful. Aristotle offered the same argument. Shame really teaches key moral values and virtues. It, it allows us to develop uh, our ethical ability. And the, amongst contemporary philosophers, Martha Nussbaum and John Rawls are amongst those who have argued that we really ought to cultivate moral shame. We ought to feel moral shame. And here it's distinguished from identity shame, the sort of identity shame that um, involves only social norms um, emptied from normative content. So if one feels shame for body weight or, or, or physical appearance or, or wealth, for instance, that is morally irrelevant. And they agree with that. But moral shame is, is a, a capacity to be... Uh, enhanced. It can reveal moral values and norms in a new light for us. So whilst identity shame is often destructive, moral shame is constructive. The key difference here is that only morality can lead to the sort of shame that again enhances one's capacity to live a good life in a manner that supports also the existence, the, the good life and the existence of other creatures. And here the focus is on what types of moral values we follow and how they impact others. So this is not an egoistic, self-directed form of shame, but a very other-directed, morally uh, involved uh, category of shame. And the contemporary philosopher Krista Thomason has maintained that there is often the 
the aforementioned discrepancy between our ideal identity and self and the real self that emerges in a state of shame. And instead of viewing this as something that we ought to withdraw from or get angry about, she proposes that we aspire to meet the ideals that we have failed. So when we are in a state of shame and realize that we are not what we wanted to be, instead of getting agonized by this, instead of letting it bring us into some sort of a mentally excruciating, uh, unbearable uh, existence, we can simply look at the ideals and try again. Do better. Take the ideals and notice that we can be different. The contemporary cultures seem to suggest that we always ought to be accepted just as we are, but perhaps we ought to change. And if we take this approach, shame might not feel so terrible. It might be actually very productive in a moral sense. This sort of change requires uh, gentle self-reflection. Jennifer Mannion is one philosopher who has, or historian, um, who has argued that if we seek to accept that we have failed, if we are critical towards ourselves, we need to do this gently with a certain sort of self-empathy. Here we undergo a dialect between our own moral values and social norms and our own ideals, but we do it gently. We accept that we are even ridiculous in our daily actions, but then gently push ourselves to do better in a manner that is empathetic towards our own, comp own capacities and context. And this sort of gentle self-reflection self calls for and enhances moral maturity. And he, uh, this concept of moral maturity really is important here. Shame is destructive when we lack maturity, when we think that we ought to be accepted, as the contemporary ethos seems to suggest, as we are, and when we, in a childlike way, argue that if we are not liked, we will just leave others or get angry at them. This sort of shame is unbearable. But if we maturely notice that everybody's failed in various ways when it comes to their moral ideals or identity ideals, and if we do this gently, we can start to develop morally productive shame, and also species shame. And I argue that moral species shame involves all these different uh, factors. It's a dialect between animal ethical values and social norms. So in a state of species shame, one might start to reconfigure what sorts of uh, animal ethical values one wants to believe in and how the surrounding social reality might go against those values. It's an animal directed, so it's not focused on the self, but on other animals. Um, and it leads into a gentle self-reflection where we really try and remap and re-explore what sorts of creatures we wish to be in relation to non-human beings. Whether we really can hold on to the combination of animal love, loving animals, and eating those very, very beings. And all this can happen in a predominantly anthropocentric society. So a person who has internalized heavily anthropocentric norms can undergo moral species shame. As long as she does this dialect and is animal directed and is suddenly disrupted to think, ecke homo, look at human beings. And I suggest that this sort of um, species shame requires also humility. Humility is in uh, philosophical and psychological literature um, linked to realism and willingness to learn. 
So in a state of humility, one is realistic about oneself. Instead of seeking to think that we are great beings and we are so capable and doing this positive psychology thing whereby we want to uh, accentuate ourselves and overemphasize how brilliant we are, we take a more realistic understanding. We are all very limited and we have various biases and failures and faults and that's fine. As long as we have willingness to learn and, and seek to do better, seek to cultivate the abilities that we have in the limits that we also hold on to. And in the context of species shame, humility implies that we don't cling on to the idea that we are pinnacles of evolution or images of God. These sorts of um, claims that are often heavily <coughs> written into anthropocentric narratives. Instead, we take species humility and accompany that with species shame. And as a result, humans appear as limited, frail creatures with much to learn and enor enormous amounts of moral growing to do. And this type of shame, I claim, should be provoked more often. It should become an integral part of doing effective animal ethics. Because holistically, on a profound level, nothing will change if we don't learn from shame. I will very quickly note that uh, shame is also a political emotion and there are different proble problems that that leads into. Um, emotions, first of all, are often always, um, of course, always entwined with politics, like writers such as Sarah Ahmed have uh, pointed out. And particularly shame is a political emotion because it's, it's so heavily reliant on social notions. The fact that shame is political is already evident in its evolutionary function. Many scholars maintain that shame is a submissive um, gesture. Uh, primates manifest and dogs manifest and various species manifest uh, shame-like gestures when they seek to submit to another dominant creature, uh, uh, conspecific. And this means that in the human context, sheer domination can cause shame. So if you have been dominated, if you have been attacked violently, for instance, you might start to feel shame. That's why rape victims might have shame. Or that's why various marginalized, marginalized groups, such as women or black people in predominantly white societies, are often more shame prone. And this all has to do with the moral destructive dimensions of shame. And this implies that shame is also a gendered emotion. Those who are raised as girls and thereby in a, in a submissive uh, position in a very patriarchal society tend to be more shame prone. There might be presumptions of inadequacy or, or weakness, expectation, expectations of quiet moral goodness, which render those who have been raised up as girls or women to be more shame prone. And Freud even argued that shame is a feminine emotion on the basis of this. And all this is also uh, relevant to the animal context. It might be more re readily acceptable for women to act on behalf of any other animals, but yet their anger or active critique against the animal industries can entwine with flashes of shame. So angry female advocates of animals are often met with propositions that perhaps they should be ashamed of themselves for being so unfeminine. So these are political uh, issues that shame can uh, spark. And also masculine identity politics is something that might uh, entwine with shame in a, in a strange way. Masculine, those following a masculine identity tend to be more inclined to approach non-human subjectivity via the lens of power hierarchies. And Carol Adams and Josephine Donovan and various other eco-feminists 
have maintained that the dualistic masculine identity entwines with oppressive species, species politics. And here shame can maintain the status quo. Masculine individuals or those individuals who want to be perceived or want to follow the social masculine identity can have very strong or acute flashes of shame over their veganism. It might be difficult to be a masculine vegan in a very masculine working environment, for instance. And here, social domination, which I mentioned just earlier, and masculine identity feed each other, whereby pro-animal capacities such as compassion, humility, care, or love begin to appear as somehow weak, feminine, and shameful. Now, these are the problematic political elements of shame, and I have to mention them because I can't advocate shame as just a uh, sound cause to, to aim towards. But I also argue that the antidote, again, is self-reflective, morally mature species shame. So the individuals who are noting how the feminine social identity or expectations or the masculine identity is making them feel shame in places where they perhaps should not feel that shame. Those individuals can reflect on why they feel shame and how to step away from it, how to be morally mature in meeting it. Just what, two more slides? Is that it? Oh, okay. So, so very quickly, there's also the politics of shamelessness, um, the Nietzschean disavowal of shame, and the attitude towards other, uh, other animals that uh, loudly shouts, I love steak, so I don't need to feel shame for this. And Martha Nussbaum is one philosopher who wanted us to imagine how horrible it would be to live in a shameless society. And my argument is that we are already in that society. The horrors are already evident in relation to other animals. We live in a very animal shameless society. We don't need to do thought experiments to think of what the society would look like. We are there. And again, this points to what the idea that shame is a capacity, not a weakness. Without it, we fail to notice faults in ourselves. And only in egoistic utopias where we believe in our own perfection, can, uh, those, uh, only egoistic utopias can celebrate shamelessness. An anthropocentric human supremacy is one such utopia. And because of this, we need uh, species shame. Thank you, and, and sorry for taking too long. So we, we will take one or two questions very quickly here and there. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much for a wonderful keynote. And uh, there are a couple of points I would like to raise uh, regarding the connection between guilt and shame. Guilt being focused on one action and, being, and shame being a rejection of the overall self is interesting because there are a number of actions that we can perform without their being linked to, to, to ourselves, without their being viewed as, viewing, viewed as definitory of ourselves. And there are actions that we cannot. For instance, I'm dressed in white. I could be dressed in black. I could be wearing a button suit. Who cares? But if I am a vegan, that is something that I see as a definition of myself. Now, I believe that one issue with species shame, which I agree with you, thank you so much for pointing this out to all of us and to me in particular. Species shame is necessary, is what we must do right now. But one 
issue that I be believe might be problematic is that omnivores do not see what they do to other animals as e s something having to do with our definition of selves. So eating animals is not defi definitory of self, it's just quote unquote normal. The woman with the giraffe is, may be defined by her in-group as a good mother, a brilliant professional, uh, whatever, but not as a wanton killer. So I believe one big point would be to change the definition of some acts as impacting the self. Unless we do this, it is problematic to arrive to uh, engender species shame, I mm. think. Mm. But species shame, I agree with you, is what we need right now. Thank you so much. It's lovely. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think that we need new categories of, of selfhood. And, and I would have, if, that, if I hadn't been speaking too long anyway, I would have mentioned uh, critique of selfhood to begin with. So that's what I'm working on as well, is, is, is the sort of um, Buddhist notion of trying to distance ourselves from rigid self-categories and, and relativizing our selfhood and realizing that it's not something that is written onto stone and, and instead we perhaps ought to try and become more fluid uh, in relation to others. So, so kind of stepping away from selfhood altogether is some, sometimes beneficial. Okay, another question there. Hi, thank you so much for a lovely, interesting talk. My name is Shiri. Uh, I'm from Israel. I'm a uh, Wittgensteinian researcher and also an EFT um, therapist, couple therapist. Uh, EFT ter uh, therapy is emotional focused therapy. And all the emotions uh, in the EFT uh, theory are connected to the attachment system in our brains and to survival. So um, in the EFT therapy, the shame, shame feeling is connected to survival. If we are ashamed, then the group might attack us, attack us or um, um, not survive, not, not uh, help us if a lion comes ancient, ancient years. Uh, in therapy, when I, when a therapy, EFT therapist uh, meets shame, um, the antidote, if I would like to add to your um, last slide of the antidote against, um, you know, the um, mechanism against shame, is to say to the person or to prove him that he's not in the um, danger of the other one leaving him. When we are feeling that the group might desert us, then we are not able to feel the shame. Then we are attacking or, f or focusing on the other or the guilt or whatever. But when we, are, um, when we feel that we can sink into the shame and not feeling that, that we are in a you know, uh, life threat, then we can go mm -hmm. to the shame. So I think that we need to, I, I think that this is something that can be, uh, gives logic to the species mm. shame. Yeah. We can feel species shame because we are the ruler of this earth, so we need to feel that and people can, can connect to that. But I think that when we are on one-on-one -on -one with, with an omnivore and we say, look at what you've done, um, he's is connected to his emotional, very, very survival, basic emotional, and cannot feel that, cannot feel the shame, unless we tell him, we're not going to desert you. Mm -hmm. You just have to join us, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very important point, and I, I, I know some of the psychological literature related to that. And um, uh, the, the idea that we are not rejected by the society for being... Cha um, being shameful in some way, is, is really, like you say, it's, it's a really important element of, of morally productive shame. And usually defenses are sparked precisely when we think that there is a rejection, social rejection ahead. So this is something that perhaps also um, vegans and critical animal scholars want to, and I'm glad that you mentioned it, want to take on board. So if you're saying to some th somebody that we're going to exclude you altogether if you are like that, 
it's not productive at all, and that leads to withdrawal and, and rage. But I think that in the contemporary political atmosphere, it's significant as well. So because of, of um, all this, this sudden, um, I don't know, bubbling up of, of, of closing, closing kind of group uh, categories and being in conflicting groups and shouting from one group to another and then barring the other groups from having any contact with one's own group, um, that can just enhance and, and lead into very unproductive forms of shame and more violence and more defenses and more rage. So, so it's, it's, it's a, it has broader implications as well. So thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. Okay, so we don't have much time because, uh, so maybe we can talk uh, with Elisa during the coffee break, is that okay? Uh, because we don't, we're already 10 minutes late, so. Uh, now we have 20 minutes or so, or 15 minutes to the coffee break, then the, the parallel session started at 11.30 here and in the, the, behind this building, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Elisa, so much.